So, you know, being a good trooper of visual effects, we all know, like, oh, yes, one must collect reference and study the element, you know? So I'm like, great, I'm going to, you know, let's book a helicopter and I'm going to go film the ocean and, you know, study it. So we go and the Coast Guard agreed to fly us. The mistake I made was I asked them, how low can you fly? I said, you know, can you guys get low? Like, I'm, you know, the guy looks at me, he's like, don't worry, we'll take care of you, you know? We go in and I'm videotaping and I'm only focused on the video camera. So I'm like filming the waves and they're talking and chatting. And then I just hear on the, on the headset, the pilot's like, okay, we're at three feet. And I was like, <laughs> what? And I put the camera aside. I'm like, oh my God, the waves are like hitting the bottom of the, you know. <laughs> oh like, my God. That's, that's plenty low. Thank you. <laughs> Can we go back up? Oh my god. Do not challenge a helicopter pilot. <laughs> Welcome to the Visual Effects Notes podcast. Today's episode is sponsored by F-Track. F-Track Review is the all-in-one collaborative workspace where you and your team can give and receive interactive feedback on projects in real time. Forget endless email threads, comments on the wrong version, or constant video calls. F-Track Review replaces all of that with a seamless back and forth. Simply add your media, share your link, and you and your teammates and clients can review from anywhere in the world in real-time, frame-accurate sync. You can also scale up to full production management with F-Track Studio. Start your free trial today at ftrack.com. And now on to the show. Hi everyone, welcome to this VFX Notes podcast. I'm Ian Fales from Befores and Afters, and as always, I'm joined by Hugo Guerra from Hugo's Desk. Hi Hugo. Hey, hey Ian. Hey great, everyone. Great to see you. Today we are joined by Habib Zagapur. Hi Habib, how are you? Hi guys, great to, great to see you Ian, and uh, nice to see you Hugo. Oh, thanks so much for joining us. <laughs> awesome to see you. Habib, I purposely didn't give you a title just then because you have done so much in the visual effects and filmmaking space. What is the best way to describe you these days? Oh, that's a tough one. Um, <laughs> I've, I've kind of adopted um, virtual production supervisor. Uh, that, that touches on more or less a lot of things I'm doing right now. Um, and yeah, it's a very interesting convergence of the whole film in real time and uh, coming together. So uh, hopefully soon, uh, you know, there's going to be uh, it just evolving, right? There's just interesting mm. titles coming up for people's roles. <laughs> yeah, of course. There's a, there's a really interesting lineage in terms of what you're doing now to what you've done previously. And just to give a bit of a teaser for everyone, we're actually going to have two episodes with Habib. Today, we're talking about his role as Associate Visual Effects Supervisor on The Perfect Storm. And another episode, we'll be looking back at, at so many of the things Habib has done. So it's really cool to talk about The Perfect Storm, Habib. It is 20-something years ago. Sorry to make you go back so far. Are you going to be able to remember? <laughs> <laughs> Oh, um, yes. It's all crystal yeah. clear still. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, this is water um, and simulated water. But could you give us a bit of a quick background on when you were at ILM, what kind of early conversations there were about what needed to be solved for this film? Yeah. So I have to context this with Twister as a background because that was the previous natural disaster film I was involved with and we were very familiar with people having access to footage of tornadoes and they were used to seeing it on the news if they hadn't seen it in real life and and so we had we had to hit that target when it came to stormy oceans uh, that's when you pause a little bit and gulp because it's a a way harder ta problem and and most everybody's seen the ocean <laughs> uh, in person probably and 
you know, even though we're doing these stormy conditions, it was um, it, it was daunting, I'd say, for sure, at the start. And, you know, this it all goes back to doing the test shot where you have to prove you can do it. And, you know, the, the twister test shot I was able to do by myself with Dennis Muir and supervising. On this one, I, I grabbed all the help I could get. I had, you know, four uh, very uh, big heavy heating R&D TDs and uh you know uh, a lot of help so that was and, and then given uh, a little extra time so we i think we had 10 weeks to do the whole the whole test shot uh, which i think you have uh but yeah so that's you know it, it was basically uh how do you take something so complex and make it manageable right uh in today's computing power it it's possible to you know, put in a simulation and and probably watch it in near real time. You know, uh, spread across a lot of GPUs. Back then, uh, it was taking a week to do simulation of one ocean, and that's on a 32 processor SGI tower. Uh, and so, you, when you, whenever you approach a visual effects uh, uh, um, film and project, you have to look at the practicality, right? So it's all well and good if you can say like, oh yeah, we can simulate this thing and come back next year, you know, and how's that <laughs> for one shot, you know. So you, you have to bring it down to um, pieces that are digestible. And so that was, I think, a big part of the task of me and the team in the beginning is like, okay, how do we take the water stuff and split it out into things that we can manage uh, and, and direct and control but also have it look natural and 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 have it be a simulation so that was i think you know it's not just a matter of just turn hey let's turn on the water does that make sense so to that effect we came up with amazing amount of names for elements of things in fact i, f I forgot to send you uh a particular slide that i i might need to share my screen on <laughs> where we came up with the names of all these different things so um that was, I think, a key. And the reason for that is, you know, you're in, you're, you're in dailies uh, looking at um, different, you know, different elements of, of water in a shot. And the supervisor needs to say, you know, take that exact specific element and do this to it, right? And, and it can't be, hey, that, that bit of water that's under the other water that's near the splash, like, it needs to be precise. So we came up with the language of, you know, bow splash and spray mist and crest foam and boat wake and splash foam. You know, splash foam is like the water that went out off the boat and back on the ocean and made foam. So that and crest mist, crest mist was like a super key element, which is the foam get, that gets blown off the top of the waves. <laughs> so, and you know, I, I don't know if I've, You've heard, or I've told you a story about the the research trip I did in a helicopter. No, go ahead and tell us. Okay, so so you know, being a good trooper of visual effects, we all know like, oh yes, one must collect reference and study the element. You know, so I'm like, great, I'm gonna you know, let's book a helicopter and I'm gonna go film the ocean and you know, study it. So we go, and the Coast Guard agreed to fly us, and. And that's an, another photo I have I need to dig up. I do have it somewhere. I found I came across it the other day. <laughs> um, archival work. But um, so I, the, the mistake I made was I asked them, how low can you fly? Because I was really concerned with, I wanted to get the reference of the helicopter wake waves, you know? You get this, this concentric rippling of water based on the, the 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 wind from the prop you know um and and so i said you know can you guys get low like i you know and uh, you know how low can you get and, and the, the guy looks at me he's like don't worry we'll take care of you you know so it'll be good so we go in and i'm videotaping and i and i have this headset on it's super loud and the waves are breaking and i'm only focused on the video camera i'm not looking out so I'm like filming the waves and they're talking and chatting. And then I just hear on the, on the headset, 
the pilot's like, okay, we're at three feet. And I was like, <laughs> what? And I put the camera aside. I'm like, oh my God, the waves are like hitting the bottom of the, you know. <laughs> oh like, my God. That's, that's plenty low. Thank you. <laughs> Can we go back up? <laughs> oh my god well you asked them like you asked, that's the thing like that's it so how low can you do get? not challenge uh, a helicopter pilot <laughs> you want me to go in, <laughs> you want me to go into the water they will want prove to do that? yeah <laughs> so needless wow. to say that was uh yeah that was a good reference trip and uh, <laughs> did, did you do another one i don't know about you hugo but i am so bad on boats like i can't even go on a flat calm um but I'm curious, Habib, did you, of course, go on some kind of fishing trawler or something like that we as well? We did. We did. Oh, my God. Yes. Yeah. Uh, Ginger Tyson was our producer and Stefan Feinmeier was the visual effects advisor. And they arranged for uh, all the key folks to get on a fishing trip in the Bay Area. And we got on a ship that's roughly the size of the Andrew Gale. And we went out. And it was, I think... I'm going to say three foot seas, three or four foot seas, which is pretty high. Mm. That's, that's, that's rough. And uh, let's just say a lot of people found out that they don't do well in those conditions. <laughs> I'm not going to name names. You'll be upset at me, but yeah. Uh, and and they, they, had a, they had a guy downstairs in the underneath cooking. And, and you got all this stuff hanging off the kitchen, dangling. And I don't know how they, how they got adapted to not getting sick in that. But one of the things that got people wasn't so much the movement. It was the diesel fumes, the combination. Mm. So it was mm. a really interesting trip. But we got lots of good photos and reference. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. Uh. Yeah, I... I uh, I gotta keep making notes of these pictures. I gotta dig up a picture of that one. Too. <laughs> uh, but um, yeah, I think those trips uh, just set the stage for us, as well as, of course, one of the things we really studied with the Sydney Hobart uh, race, hmm. the sailing race where they just, uh, you know, sailboats were decimated and they had to rescue people, and that was seventy foot waves. And there yeah. was a lot of good helicopter footage. VHS quality, but still helicopter footage, uh, you know, of those waves. And we studied those really well because that was really close to the conditions we would need for most of it. And and I guess might be a good time, Habib, to also talk about the state of play in computational fluid dynamics and particle sims at ILM, but also in the industry. As you mentioned, you did Twister, but where were things at? in this very early 2000s um take us through that yes so um we we looked around and found a professor of fluid dynamics john anderson and he'd been teaching fluid dynamics for 20 years and he had uh you know equations to describe them but uh, you know to actually write something that can produce usable results for film and you know and have it be efficient so uh, we hired him and he started working on the algorithms and um, the, it, I, what I do know is it involved a lot of FFTs, fast Fourier transforms, uh, which is the level of math that's, you know, usually um, it kind of, you, it works, but it's hard to really understand what it's doing. Um, but it, it's like solving things in the frequency domain or something like that you know you translate you translate the math to another domain and then by doing simple addition and subtraction you're actually doing integration then you bring it back from that space that's kind of the the gist of it but um what we were doing is he was running these simulations basically by literally blowing wind on the ocean for days so in in this 32 processor tower sgi tower there's wind being blown on it, and then every day the waves get taller as the wind keeps blowing on it. And he had a he he had it so that it could algorithmically self tile, so it was automatically tileable. So any wave going off the back would come back, you know, off the sides. So that was a nice thing for us. 
But what he would do is, as the waves get taller, he would save out the states. So that would be like a wave that we could use, you know, a wave wave simulation. And so each day we would get the taller waves. We got 10 foot, 20 foot, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, you know. And then for the big wave that crumbles, you know, the, the 150 foot wave uh, that they run, run into, and there's scientific things behind that, by the way. Uh, for that one, he had to do a special, like, fictitious dump tanks. There was like, he had this really high uh, waves, 70 foot waves, and then he had these enormous dump tanks of, you know, size of Texas water that he would drop into the ocean, and the two combinations of those two plus these waves would give him the 150 foot wave, because, you know, he has to deal with real physics. You know, us CG guys were like, ah, just pull the spline up, you know. And it's a whole <laughs> different thing if you're actually simulating it. It's not the same thing. So he's like dropping like comets into the water, almost like there's an asteroid hitting Earth. And exactly. Like giving you like... <laughs> yeah. It, it, it's That's awesome. totally different. So, <laughs> so then, uh, you know, we, you know, the real story is the, I don't know, if you know the details, but the, the ship disappeared. It was a top heavy ship. Mm. And, you know, it just, they never saw it. And the, the perfect storm was the, the, the weatherman gave it that name, which was three storms coming together in the same spot. So they got really unlucky. But one of the things that happened is there's buoys that measure wave height. And, and the buoys measured a 150 foot wave. But, this is the big but, they are chained yeah at the height of a 150 foot wave so it could have been any amount taller mm. that's just the minimum mm. uh, and that's what we built for the film but it could have been even taller wow. if you can imagine wow i just want to go back to something quickly there Habib. you mentioned sgi towers one thing when i first met hugo that i was really excited about was he was collecting like old servers oh in SGI. Have God. you still got those, Hugo? No, I, 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 no, I do. I, I still have old computers and old Amigas and old. Uh, com yeah, I have a bunch of computers here in my house, <laughs> but uh, but I still haven't collected. Uh, I got offered uh, by a friend, got offered to get like uh, like an Octane, and I haven't gone and collected yet. You know, because it was just about when the pandemic happened and I was going to oh fly there God. and go and pick it up. I still have to go and pick it up. But yeah, I do collect old technology. You should yes. pick it up for me because I got some 3M tapes I want to read. <laughs> 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 you know, the little 3M 150 megabyte uh, tapes. Well, SGIs can read those. You need the... I think I have the cables and the drive. <laughs> Actually, no, you I, be one time you had some spawn... Um, footage that you wanted to share with me but we couldn't read it because it wasn't on an sgi i don't know if you <laughs> yeah, remember that that's right it's yeah. true <laughs> i guess like one of the things that i wanted to ask because i'm not entirely sure if it was one of the first films that had that kind of thing but but maybe it was one of the first on ilm but i was really really uh, blown away by the amount of elements that you guys were outputting because you know i'm 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 a composter by heart, so I've, I, I always was watching those breakdowns with, with, uh, with like amazement, looking at all yeah. the different particle layers you had and all the, the way that you actually managed to mask the boat. Because these are real plates, like were shot on a stage, like you have like the hydraulics going, you have all the water going, then you have that blue screen. Obviously, I'm not even going to go into the details of how hard this must have been to key and to roto at the time because yeah. it's 22 years ago. Must have been really difficult because we didn't have like the tools we have today. But I was just wondering, like, how I was really impressed by the amount of elements you brought in because you really broke down all the water into so many different little little elements that compositors could could put together. Was the compositing done at the time similar to what a comp is today? Because it seems to me like the you guys were really like breaking new grounds on terms of composting to doing this, wasn't it? Like, was it normal that you had so many elements and did you merging it like this? Because now it is normal, but I wasn't, I wasn't sure if it was, if it's something new at the time. Um, it was a bit more than what you normally would, would do on an ILM show. Um, you know, 
normally you'd have like the background and then uh, let's say the T-Rex and the T-Rex shadow, some atmosphere, maybe maybe separate out the specular. Because we were dealing with these water elements, you know, and, and splashes and, the, and the, sometimes the real ship, sometimes the CG ship, uh, sometimes real crew, sometimes the CG crew. Um, that's where it got into the complication of all these layers and also ability to control them if the director said, hey, can you make the boat wake a little dimmer or, you know, turn that splash up. Uh, the, we, we needed to be able to do that. And I think the simulation aspect shouldn't be understated. That, that's a really big factor in affecting things because we would have shots that would look great. It just happens sometimes, you know. It's like paintings, you know, if you overwork a painting, uh, it's, you know, there's a peak point where you reach, uh, you have to <laughs> stop, you know. There was a few <laughs> shots, most of the shots, you know, that, all of them turned out um, great. So there was a few shots where I remember looking and, we, okay, those waves look perfect. But then uh, there'd be, you know, the need to, like, have some timing change on the waves or, you know, make some waves closer to other waves or just some some modification that would then take it past that point where it looked great and then it looks a little overworked you know because you're dealing with simulations right or you're dealing with something that uh, needs to look natural you know um, i have that slide of uh the element names and if i could share my screen this is this is just some of them uh should i show it now yeah. Go ahead, please. Let's see. So uh, this is going to date itself because it's um, the aspect ratio of the PowerPoint <laughs> is, <laughs> is uh, yeah, it's a giveaway. Okay, here we go. Yeah, so awesome. very, uh, this is very basic. We had uh, like a dozen elements that we would name, but just here you can see we needed to, we needed to name the different parts of a breaking wave. So we had the ruffling foam where the particles are going up and down. Then crest foam was a big element that was uh, the, the foam that's left behind. Then the churn was the kind of subscattered, uh, greener, lower below the water element that it left behind. Uh, wait, wait, yeah. wait, Hugo. I mean, Habib, that's a live action real shot that's not a simulated wave that you're showing us oh now. yeah this is a photo from the helicopter <laughs> oh right wow <laughs> and then uh you know that you know this was before we got the three feet um <laughs> <laughs> uh, but you know the, the 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 interesting thing was uh that i ended up making the shader for the oceans and uh and you, you know there's some shots that you have i think uh showing the very first versions um, but that was using, you know, I, I ended up using fractals to simulate uh, all the different kinds of foam. There's streaking foam, which is kind of lines that are blown by the wind. Um, and, and so the, the ocean shader had about a dozen noise functions for a dozen different kinds of foam. Uh, but the cool thing about it being procedural was that you could zoom in the camera like to this point and see bubbles in the foam. There was no texture limitation. It was all procedural, so you could basically be as close or as far as you wanted to be. Uh, so that that was interesting. That raises an interesting question about you mentioned John Anderson's work on the sort of big waves and and his stuff. You seem to be more responsible, Habib, unless I've got this wrong, for the foam and particles. Is that right? Yeah, so John gave us the basic waves. So these would be, um, you know, we would bring these in as height fields. Uh, that would that would that in Maya we would put a mesh and displace it, and we could actually read these wave files, the height these height files. We could read them in real time off the server, and and actually watch the waves. So it was really really interesting to just you could just switch wave heights. We had a little uh, Maya shelf with a menu for the director where he could say, oh, give me a 30 foot wave, click, pink, you know, and that was one of the fascinating things about the project was uh, the, you know, the virtual production aspect of it. This is like before there was such a term, but we were able to navigate the ocean in real time, pick an ocean, 
find a corner, drop the boat in it, drop the camera boat with the camera on it, compose the shot the way he wants to, hit play and get a shot in real time. Because the camera itself was physics driven. And given, it, you know, I think you've seen in some of the videos, right? The targeting system. And so I wrote the boat dynamics to, so, to simulate the boats. And I had help with John Anderson for part of that equation, which was the, the drag coefficient, the drag from the water. Um, before doing this project, I was assuming that buoyancy is the main factor, uh, is the main force that keeps boats, you know, uh, in the ocean. It's not. It's actually the water drag. And before I had that component, my boats were flying out of the wave all the time. I think you saw the bloopers. So that was <laughs> the learning discovery there. But basically, um, uh, you, were, you were just dynamically able to perform a shot, you know. Uh, and, and so that was what's interesting. And statistically, we had 400 visual effects shots. And half of those were all CG. That means entirely CG. So the, the ship, the crew, the splashes, the ocean, everything. And, and, this, and this was like the full CG shots a bit. Were they, they were like, what, 2K resolution probably, weren't they? So this was like in two, 2000, like, well, actually 99, you were rendering 2K, like 200 CG shots in 2K. <laughs> Oh yeah, <laughs> that's, and, and that's each, insane. Each shot had you know the ten layers at least, and the layer that took the longest to render was the volumetric lights on the ship. That, yeah, of that element was five hours a frame. Oh my god! The other elements were close god. to an hour a frame. So <laughs> it's not just how many hours to to render a frame; it's how many hours per layer, and that that would add up, right? So you had the ocean layer, the boat layer, uh, yeah, the crest foam, the crest. Can I, I, I didn't mean to like be so technical about this and I know like I'm sure like the, I was just curious like this was like 2k what kind of format was it was it like in 10 bit 12 bit 8 bit what what kind of what kind of uh, quality were you guys rendering this kind of thing Ooh, I don't know am I gonna get in legal yeah. hot water here but no it's um, you know basically at that point I think it's pretty common knowledge that we were still using the log format. Uh, Ireland was using a log format, and it wasn't until we were working on signs uh, that was the, uh, I was working on signs, and that was the first show to use EXRs. Oh wow! Okay. And so you were using like SGIs or Targas or what are we using? It was then? SGIs. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And we did okay. a transition from uh, Unix to Linux machines uh, because Unix was being retired. Um, and I was actually one of the people that was testing uh, hardware and software and like OSs to see how they perform. Uh, but, you know, the I remember on signs, we, we, we were doing the EXR renders. This is going to sound funny in context now, but the files were went from two megs a frame to 10. And, and I remember <laughs> we were like, 10 megs a frame? This is never going to fit on the drive. Like, you're insane. <laughs> <laughs> wow, ten megs. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's all relevant. Yeah, but, but it must it must have been so difficult because, like you said, with all these elements, the volumetrics and all the splashes, there was no deep compositing at the time, so you had to do an enormous amount of 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 cutout masks. I guess you had to like really, especially for the shots for the real shots. I mean, the accuracy of the match move would have to be like perfect for the cutout mask. Or yes, did you guys have to deal with like? Roto in paint and warping to try to get it into work, or was it like actually that accurate when you were for the matching? most part? They were the camera was were really matched really well. Um, there was some paint work sometimes on edges, but for the most part, the cameras uh, lined up really well. And you know, your question about blue screen compositing before, uh, <laughs> you, the blue screen was reflecting on the water. Yeah, <laughs> we saw. and yeah. it you just, see it on the footage. Yeah, like it's, it's just everything exactly. is blue. <laughs> so it, it just so happens that was actually a blessing, because <laughs> what it did was instead of the real to CG waterline being a solid line that you could see, it was it was this completely random dappled fade, based on the waves that reflected. So anything that reflected blue 
would get the CG ocean and it would just transition in this weird fluid sim way uh, into the real ocean. Uh, it did mean we have to match the overall movement of the wave to the sim. So that was the hard part. But uh, Yeah, but I know what you mean because that way you didn't have to like really create a line. It was just like almost like a pattern, almost like a, it's like a, like a mask. It's like a dark fade. Like a, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Which is, Double yeah, I, fade, guess, yeah. I guess it was a... You must have been worried when you first saw it, but then it became kind of actually not that. Yeah, yeah it, it became, became a, a help better. for sure. Yeah, yeah exactly. There's one shot with the two people in the foreground bobbing up and down in the helicopter in the background and someone jumping in the water. That shot really shows that interaction really well because that's going from the real wave to the to the yeah. digital wave. And I I must say this like before you know before like like before we go any further. This film looks astonishing. So, like, I mean, congratulations to you and your team because it's still... I just watched it in my projector in my living room a few days ago again in the best quality I could find. Unfortunately, there's no 4K version of this film, but there's, like, a, a, a very good transfer in, in, in HD. Oh, they should And this fun. film looks stunning. Thank I mean, you so you much. Guys got, yeah. yeah, you guys got so close. And it's funny watching your footage... You you actually have a slide where you have a you're comparing real water with your water. It does look the same. It's insane yeah. how close you got. Like I, even to this day, I still see films, and I still think that this was probably one of the best storm, rain water film ever made. Like I I and it's been 22 years. It's incredible how how Thank old you. it is, but looks stunning. Thank so, you so yeah, much. I. Uh, <laughs> it was really. Uh, the team and attention to detail. One of my favorite things is the droplet pass, where it's it's you know droplets of water or rain, either one. Uh, one of the things that really kills me when I see visual effects sometimes um, in modern day is when they put rain or water droplets and it's it's a it's a solid gray line. Mm -hmm. yeah. And anybody who's been in a shower knows. <laughs> that it's never a solid line. It's totally filled with different highlights, and it's it's different every frame. So you know we 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 simulated that in a clever way, but we got that exact same effect. You know, is each raindrop has a unique pattern on it that changes, uh, and and your eye catches those kind of details. You know, um, you need to match. That. That's the tough thing about replicating nature. You know, people people are going to be ruthless looking at it, right? Because they've seen the real thing. <laughs> yeah. And that was the big... I, I wanted to ask you a bit about replicating nature with the tools at the time, Habib. Yeah. I feel like you had become a, a power Maya user. And part of that came out of Phantom Menace's pod race. And obviously, I imagine you'd been using Alias Wavefront prior to that. Yeah. But at the time of Perfect Storm... Was it very obvious that you would be using Maya for particle simulations? Was Prisms or Houdini even an option back then? Was there something else? I'm, I'm curious about your choices back then. Yeah, this is interesting. So, so actually, um, Dynamation was the only choice I, was, I knew how to use back then, before mm. Maya, before Maya came out. So mm. on Twister, we were using Dynamation. And uh, I actually even use it on uh, on the mask for some of the Jim Carrey uh, gas that uh, the right. green gas that would come off his face. And um, it, you know, when Maya came around, that was the big light bulb for me because I was one of the few that knew how to use Mel. At the, it's called Sophia in, in Dynamation, but it's the same thing. The Maya embedded language, right? The scripting. I was used to using that on particles. And so, you know, you could do so much because you're, it's like commanding an army. You have, you have like all the particles, they have IDs, they have positions, and you can do all kinds of math based on that, you know? You can find where they are relative to each other, relative to some, some object, give them forces, it's amazing. Uh, then when Maya came out, they're like, hey, you know that, that mail you know, you can, uh, you can uh, apply that to anything in the scene. <laughs> <laughs> including rigid body dynamics that are near real time. And I was like, my, you know, I was like, oh my God, I'm going to have a field day. Um, but you're mentioning Houdini. I'm not going to, I know 
side effects was working on which when did that come out exactly what year i'm not familiar houdini was kind of available in 1996 but you know in 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 basically a transfer from prisms and then you know they've kept developing it um i've probably got that year wrong but you know around about that time yeah. yeah, it was. It was. I think it was that year, or or mm. maybe clo- like maybe ninety seven. I can't. Re- I think it mm. is ninety six. Yeah, yeah. And and, and babe, what what were you using for compositing? Was it comp time or was it something else at the time? It was called iComp. iComp. I-comp. Uh, so is is that ILMs as well? Yes. Like, like comp time. It was, and it was a scripting language, comp- compositing. Um, be, believe it or not, before that we were using C sharp script batch scripts oh my so God. it was like uh it's you know <laughs> like unix commands of you know comp this over this plus this you know you know, using a this, over B this is this percentage so of transparency <laughs> which is exactly what i was using for dinosaurs adventure of the dinosaur city uh on a windows machine back in 1990 that's a whole nother that was a digital arts system but you know, then ILM made iComp, which was a much more refined version of scripting because unlike regular bash scripting where you just have one line after line after line and there's no ability to do loops, uh, in iComp you could do loops. So you say for i equals one to whatever, iterate and do this, 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 you know, and then do this and then do this. So you can, you know, you can nest things yeah, it was <laughs> super fancy. So you, yeah. so you had no, wow. you had no proper viewer interface. You would just have to wait for the processing to see a frame, I guess. Yeah, and then you would have to preview it. That's yeah. what I remember. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, wow. That is. That but is. It was, we were used more... to it because we couldn't see renders either until the whole thing yeah. finished. <laughs> I, I I know, but now I'm even more impressed because compositing something like this with so many layers without even it's like compositing it blindly. I, I don't even imagine how is that even possible because it looks so seamless. Literally, when I was watching these breakdowns, this looks like a, a, a normal breakdown of visual effects of a comp from now, you know, like like you look at the breakdown and you think, Oh yeah, this was probably done in two thousand and ten <laughs> or two thousand twelve or something like that, or two thousand and fifteen. Awesome. And and you look at it, and now you're telling me that it's like script based, like in in without a gi- with a, without an interface and everything, and it's like w- wow, it's even more <laughs> it's even more impressive now. I I yeah, I I, fo- I thought it was something with an interface. I thought maybe ILM was already using something at the time, but yeah, well, sh- like yeah. Yeah, and I, if you want to see like- it moving, you have to wait overnight. <laughs> <laughs> of course, no, literally. So that's yeah. In contrast to my current. Uh, day job with real time, <laughs> but you know you have you had um, eight hours in the day. Let's say, of course, we worked a little longer sometimes, but you know that if it takes an hour for you to get your frame, uh, optimistically, because you're talking about lots of layers, but you could launch a job over multiple processors and then have each one do a layer. Uh, but if it took you an hour to get your single frame, and then you could make adjustments based on that, you have eight chances in a day to make tweaks so you get eight tweaks <laughs> and then run it overnight come back the next day and see what it looks like moving it's a tough yeah. tough way to work wow <laughs> wow yeah yeah and it's That's insane isn't it because it's 22 years ago and you think wow it's like the same now right when- yeah. <laughs> things went so fast like things are really going fast like it's insane and now we're getting for real unreal or or like real and like real time engine it's just it's just yeah it's it's very fascinating to see it like that into that perspective it's amazing the <laughs> hardware yeah yeah habib two things maybe before we wrap up i wanted to give a shout out to an amazing chapter of a book you contributed to i don't know if you remember this i'm sure you remember writing Maya it, it was super in depth pros yeah <laughs> yeah, yeah this Everyone, if you can get a hold of this book, this just does not happen anymore. Hippie wrote a detailed analysis of the work in Perfect Storm and the use of Maya and also thinking behind naturalistic and simulated water and particles and wave crest. 
um, it just doesn't happen anymore that anyone is able to break down film work yeah. like that, Habib. So it's like a treasure to have that yeah. chapter in that book. So thank you That's for writing It's that. an amazing chapter. It's an amazing awesome chapter. I read, it, I read it this morning. And for people that want to have, have a look at it, I I actually I actually just bought it on eBay. Um, you know, oh. there is a lot of people selling it on eBay. It's two pounds or three pounds or something like that. So, and I really recommend everyone to go and buy it because this chapter alone, the rest of the book is good as well. There's other things that are really mm. nice on the book, but this chapter, I I don't think I've ever seen this kind of level of granular detail about never. a visual effects from a Hollywood movie. I've never, this has never been allowed ever since, ever. Like a, a studio would never allow it ever now. Is that, is that the price or the weight? <laughs> but have the no it was three pounds no sorry three pounds i'm in britain sorry okay. so that's like uh, sorry sorry say, three I pounds even, i didn't no, no, no. ask you where you're based <laughs> <laughs> sorry no i'm in i'm in i mean i bought it on ebay uk i'm in london oh. so i think it was like five dollars yes five us dollars i don't know i don't know how many canadian yeah. i don't know many how many australian yeah <laughs> so it i don't know really how many good, australian the ilm executives to allow that and mm. and, and actually um encourage it and I know firsthand that many people have come up to me after who from other facilities that said, you know, they used that as a basis for doing water for their projects. And so that's, Amazing. you know, really good to hear industry wise, you know. It's a shame that it doesn't happen anymore, isn't it, Habib? Like, I, I feel like I know that there are secrets and I know that people, I know studios and also facilities and also like film studios are really keen on keeping a lot of things. But it is a shame that it doesn't happen a bit later, you know, a couple of years after the film is out, once the technology has advanced. It would have been so good if we would have known more of these films because, you know, it's not a secret. If you, if you like, wait like five years, it becomes obsolete anyway. It's a shame that we don't get those kind of showcases anymore, you know. Yeah, I think, so, you know, some, sometimes Seagraph uh, papers can bring some of that. Uh, but that t that's really difficult to uh, prepare and present, and you know you have to be, you have to submit six months in advance or nine months in advance. So it's 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 a tough circuit unless you're used to uh, you know the academic side. But yeah, I agree. Uh, it'd be great if there's more sharing. Yeah, and just finally, Habib, obviously this film did so well, and I think people just really like George Clooney and Mark Wahlberg's performances and the performance of the Digital Oceans. You were nominated for the VFX Oscar. I just wanted to quickly ask you about that experience. This was a time when only three films were nominated at the time for visual effects. Um, I believe well, Gladiator won that year and Perfect Storm. I'm trying to remember the other film, but that's embarrassing that I've forgotten. Do you remember it all, Habib? Um, I can look oh, it up. Oh, for, we, the, uh, for the Oscars that year, I definitely remember Gladiator because we... Uh, <laughs> We're up against uh, John Nelson, which I became very close friends with, mm. uh, and we we got the BAFTA, and uh, and he he won the Oscar, um, and I think I remember I used, I used to work at the mill. That Oscar is still on the front of the mill. <laughs> we still have it on the on the glass. That's the only Oscar the mill won as mill film. Um, yeah. you know, before they closed the first yeah. time. Yeah. Well, of course, the other film was Hollow Man. And yes. I, Scott Anderson and Tippett yeah. had done such a great job on that, that film as well. And I, I but I just wanted to ask you about the Oscar well. experience. Oh, yeah. Um, it, it's always amazing to go, to, to go there. It's, it's surreal. Um, you know, you, you, uh, you're on the red carpet, you have to paint yourself. And, you know, all these um, celebrities and directors and, and talents are around you. And then... Um, you know, when you're nominated, it's it's a uh, very stressful. <laughs> you you try and be detached. You know, I remember um, I had my hopes up for Twister, and it was really disappointing. Um, but uh, I remember Dennis Muren saying, "Well, you know, you you have to buy the um, L.A. Weekly and New York Times. There's two two magazines that he said like newspapers. He said those newspapers predict the results very accurately." You know, uh, so for Perfect Storm, we got the two newspapers and they both predicted Perfect Storm. 
Oh. But it, it turned out not to be so accurate. <laughs> <laughs> just just our luck. But, uh, you know, uh, being a, a voting member of the Academy, um, I kind of understand the dynamics. Um, you know, if you're up against a movie that's got 14 nominations and yours has two and, you know, the other movies emotionally uh, really gripping... Uh, as well as their visual work was really great, you know, so the, the work John Nelson and the mill had done, you know, to make that stadium. And I think each each um, winning film has like a key shot that, that they showcase and they they had this rotating shot uh, going around the gladiator and 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 you see the before and after of, you know, stretching it up. And that was like really um uh, etched in everybody's mind and then for independence day it was the white house blowing up <laughs> the white house miniature <laughs> blowing up so that there's uh you know but uh, it was great to actually work with john nelson on blade runner 2049 so we both really enjoyed working together uh with denny villeneuve and so you know uh the oscar experience was tough <laughs> uh but you know, all the nominated films are so good. You never, really, you, you know, any any one of them really is is well, well deserved. And and uh, you know, I I do think uh, it was difficult. Two things that were difficult. One was I don't know how many people how voters saw the Perfect Storm. The other thing was the screeners that year were VHS. And one of the really unfortunate things that happens with VHS is they cropped it to four by three. Yeah. Oh. Instead pen, of pen uh, scan, instead yeah. of shrinking it, and so it just so happened that the way we composed a lot of the shots, we had the ship, and then we had ocean on the sides. And so the one thing that got cut off by the four by three was the oceans on the sides. Um, the other thing was the <clears throat> um, I did a presentation to the academy afterwards a few years later about the Bake Off reel, and I got a lot of reactions of people saying they had no idea that those shots were all digital. So that was another interesting educational mm. thing. They just mm. assumed we just uh, it was all live action ships and we extended the water. Uh, but you which know. is also like yeah. the biggest compliment you could ever get, isn't it? That's true. Yeah, it's like <laughs> the worst uh, compliment for a map painter is nice map painting. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> They're like, I had no idea it was CG. Like, isn't it real? Uh, no. Yeah. <laughs> there, there's no, one. Just... There's one real shot of a sto- uh, the ship in stormy seas. One real shot. Oh yeah, you have it on the book, I think. I I, I saw it yeah, on the book it's the on the Maya book. Yeah, it's exactly. there. It's yeah, a yeah, profile yeah. shot. <laughs> wow. <laughs> well, it's so cool going back to that film two decades later, Habib. Thank you for going to that detail. Everyone, also check out our other chat with Habib where we talk about his path to virtual production. But thank you, Habib, so much for chatting about Perfect Storm. Really appreciate it. Thank you guys for having me, and uh, I love discussing this stuff. It's great. <laughs> awesome see you later thank you so much thank you thank you